So we're here at the Workforce Analytics Summit uh, at your last day. It's been very exciting, very tiring two days, but it's really full of energy and full of passion. And it's a great pleasure to me to interview today uh, Giovanni Averdin, who's the head of strategy KGR and communication at Tanfid, who flew all the way here from Dubai. So welcome, good to have you here. And we saw your presentation, very exciting. And you are advocating uh, age analytics at yeah. Tanfid. Now, why are you so passionate about this topic? I'm genuinely very passionate about HR. Um, you know, I, I find it really hard if you're a professional or something not to be passionate about it. I mean, this is what you do, so may as well be passionate. But in particular, analytics for me is the future. Right? A lot of my work, I'm fortunate enough that I can focus a lot of my work looking at the workforce of the future. Um, and analytics is a key part of that. And what I find is that for HR to move from you know, the traditional doing admin to more strategic, I don't understand how not being passionate about analytics will ever get you there. Like, the core about being strategic for me is bringing analytics to the table. Okay. And use an example that sometimes business executives look at analytics and say it's like being in a water park. And then, but in reality, your example was it's like climbing uphill yeah. in a battle. What was the big, you, you advocate, you launched age of analytics, analytics at Tan Faith. What was the biggest uh, two or three obstacles you faced uh, during your journey? Only two or three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there's two things. One is getting a clear agreement on what analytics is. Right? Everyone in the business will tell you analytics for me means, you know, for some people analytics just means operational reporting. For some people they meant I want to Google stuff. I'm like, what Google stuff in particular you want? Just Google stuff, you know, cool stuff. Just surprise me. Show me predictive stuff. So getting the executive team to think about what are the key questions that you need answered that are related to your business problems and move away from having a wish list to a what is the core of running your business. That was one. The second one is HR professionals in general are hesitant when it comes to analytics. I think the capability is not necessarily where it needs to be yet. And as a result, people are a bit worried. Um, people are worried because it's a big part of HR. And if you don't understand it, they might feel they're missing the boat. Uh, our business partners in particular were very, uh, are, I should say, very uh, resistant still. Because what analytics does in one way is it exposes a lot of things. It shines light in the darkness. Right? And the second thing that it does is it, it moves a lot of responsibilities and power slash control away from the, biz, uh, from the business partners directly into the business. And still to this day, they don't like it when we provide direct access to your data. They feel they should be the intermediaries who kind of give the data. My view is unless you provide analysis or interpretation or insight, you're not adding any value. If you're just downloading a report and giving it to me, I may as well download that report myself. And your organization, Tanfit, went through a really rapid growth in terms yes. of number of employees. I think, if I'm not mistaken, you started with 20 people, yeah. now currently around two and a half, three thousand, under 3,000, under 3, under yeah. 3, 000, so, yeah. and, it's, and it's happened in, what, three four to four years. years. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lot of change, a lot of, uh, yeah. it's a very rapid growth. Now, in your organization, where does HR analytics sit in regards to the overall uh, business analytics? What's the best way, how is it structured mm -hmm. to make sure that you get the right insights, not just around your people, but also about the, uh, the related business information. So, you know, it reports into it reports into me actually. So it reports into HR, and that's for a reason because I think analytics uh, without functional contextual knowledge um, is not very useful in HR, and I think in any domain. So functional knowledge is important, but where it sits in the broader strategy of what we're doing is that right now I don't report any HR data without business data. So we had a we had a panel earlier, and I think the question was is it possible to integrate it to? Not only is it possible, I think it's very possible, it's critical to do that. What's the point of looking at an attrition statistic or the engagement if you don't put it in context with revenue growth or quality or compliance or um, you know, organic growth? So what we're doing is when we look at any of these HR metrics, whether it's headcount growth or the more strategic ones, we look at it in terms of how is the overall business trending? So if my engagement is going down, but my revenue is going up, my attrition is going down, then does that engagement really have a predictive driver uh, function to my revenue? Doesn't seem to be that way, right? So we don't necessarily just accept any metric and we don't look at it black and white from, oh, attrition going up is bad. Sometimes attrition going up can be really good, especially in a downturn, or when your attrition is going up in particular in poor performance, right? Um, so answering your question, I don't really see how you can have a value proposition in HR if you don't link it to the business uh, metrics. And for us, that meant two things in particular. Finance, 
we went through a lot of battles and then ultimately got to a common agreement with the CFO function to make sure that whatever we report is the same thing, we speak the same language and we agree on the definitions. That was a really big one. If anything, they're now so comfortable with HR providing the data, they no longer run reports. They take our reports and they just do their analysis. And then kind of blend in the more, you know, the non-FTE numbers. Uh, the second one was our operations leaders. The last thing you want to do, if you have a system, it's always lagging. It will never be real-time accurate. So if I'm an ops leader and I will count my people, there is a chance that there's one person that will be that will not be there, but will show up in the report because he resigned maybe just after the cutoff, and as a result, he's still reflecting in that report. We had to get the trust and the credibility with them to say, look, we know what we're doing. There's a number of reasons why they don't always tally up, but trust us, at least consistently we're doing that. So there we are. So in your organization, does it function like kind of an analytics center of excellence, like a central function, or or is it or analytics itself? It's distributed in among it's, various lines. It's both. We have a central BI business intelligence team, basically in a center of excellence for analytics. But we still have, for the time being, I still have people in within HR specializing on that. The plan is long term. I want to roll them up into the broader team. But for the time being, because we're just building up this whole function, it was really critical for me to have functional expertise. What I found is if you have an, an, someone who's good in analysis do HR work because they lack the kind of terms of reference, you might read something and factually you might see that you know, some, a, a certain trend is happening, but if you don't understand what that means within a broader HR context, you might be uh, misrepresenting insight. And that's why we kept it in-house. I think in the next six months or so when we feel it's very stable, we'll roll it up. So the resource will still be aligned to me and it will be specialized in HR, but it will be reporting into the... Uh, our, uh, well, it's not global, but our head of uh, business intelligence. Uh, last question is about yeah. behavior science, and we heard in a mm. conference that yeah, look at data, look at people, look at data, but don't forget that at the end of the day, people must make decision about people. Yeah. So how does you, how is your team structured? How do you ensure that you are while you're relying on data, uh, you are actually considering that there are people behind those numbers, and you make the right people decisions? Hmm. First and foremost, I don't. So I don't believe that, you know, there's people who say machine learning, you don't even have to do anything, just switch on a machine and we'll do everything for you. I fundamentally disagree. I think what machine learning can do is provide you the analysis, do a lot of the prep work, but unless you have people actually analyzing that data and interpreting that data, um, you're losing out. The second thing, let me think about this, because I think the way we're structured is that while we have an analytics team, nothing goes out, so it's never a matter of running a report, you get some insight and it goes to the leadership team. We'll first have a debate within HR and say, does this make sense? Right? Maybe there's a reason why we find these numbers that, have, that, is, that is not necessarily captured in data, right? that's captured in contextual information, focus groups, or you know, a number of other kind of environmental uh, factors. So we do that. Um, we do a first round of kind of validating and uh, fine tuning. And then even in our leadership team, we bring it up as a, this is a fact, this is not the fact. Right? The syst- we might find that it would be logical to, I don't know, um, make a change in our policy based on what we see, but then we have a debate and actually think it through. So what it does is it facilitates and enables discussion, but it doesn't uh, necessarily directly enable decision making. The decision making still happens um, with a little bit of broader consideration of the facts. Giovanni, yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you.